MegCram.com. Welcome to another MegCram lecture. We're going to talk about this EKG and try to get to the right diagnosis. So this is a 48-year-old gentleman who presents to the emergency room with about a 24-hour onset of progressive dyspnea, shortness of breath, and chest pain. Our meticulous, organized way of going through this EKG is, as you recall, rate, rhythm, and then access. And then we'll get to the special things at that point. So the first thing we want to do is figure out the rate. And I've left some of the numbers up here so we can check it later. I've also left the interpretation on this EKG. The first thing we want to do is look here at the QRS and lead one. And you can see here that it starts right at this box. And there's a little bit of space between there and here. So if we count up those boxes, we get about two and a half boxes. So when we know the number of boxes between the QRS complexes, we simply take 300 and we divide it by 2.5 boxes. And the number that we get is equal to about 120. And that's going to be our ventricular rate. And so we confirm here that the ventricular rate is actually 118. So we're pretty close. So that's the rate. The next thing we need to do is figure out what the rhythm is, and we can see here clearly before each QRS is a P wave. And we don't see any intervening P waves around it or through it, and so this is going to be a sinus rhythm, and because there's a tachycardia, because we are greater than 100 beats per minute, this is going to be a sinus tachycardia. And so we get the first diagnosis correctly. The next thing we need to do is to look at the axis. So let's review axis again. Remember with axis, we've got a circle and zero degrees is out here at the far right. And we go around this direction in a positive sense. And we go around this direction in a negative sense. And remember that generally speaking, the normal axis is going to be in this quadrant down here. There's several ways of looking at this, and if you go through the EKG course at megcram.com, we'll go through different techniques of having to do it. Probably the simplest way is to look at the axis leads on the EKG that are already aligned at the 90 degrees position and also the zero degrees position. So the one that's aligned at the zero degrees position is the lead Roman numeral one, and that is this lead right here. If anything is positive in that lead, then it's going to be going positively towards this zero position. However, if the QRS is negative in this position, it's going in exactly the opposite direction. This is the negative for lead one. And so what is the ventricular axis? By looking at the QRS complex, we can see clearly here that the majority of that QRS complex is in the negative position. In fact, if we were to measure in terms of amplitude, it's about one large box down. So in that case, we know that our axis, and I'll do it here in red, is going to be predominantly in this direction, which is abnormal. This is not normal. Normally, we have a left-leaning axis, and in this case, we don't. So let's keep going and see. So what we want to do is not only look at here at the x-axis, but we want to look at the y-axis, the axis that's aligned at 90 degrees right here. And so for that, we're going to look at AVF. AVF is the one that is aligned going down in this direction. So again, we look at the QRS complex. If it is going up, then it's generally going to be in the positive direction. And if it is going down, it's going to be in the negative direction up here. And clearly, we can see we're approximately about the same as a box. It is going up. So in this case, we're going to have a positive deflection because this QRS is going up. And so therefore, we will draw the resultant going down. So in other words, our axis is going to be somewhere in between these arrows. So it's going to be in that quadrant. And if you look at this, they're just about the same. I think you would be able to say that the AVF positive amplitude is a little bit bigger than the negative amplitude in lead one, only because part of this is actually going up and it's taking away from that vector. So I would say overall, and I'll put this in blue or in purple so we can see here that it's going to be closer to the 90 than it would be to the 180. And so I would say overall that the vector here is going to be in this direction, which would be around 120 degrees or even a little bit more, maybe even to 135 degrees. So let's check and see here. 
p-axis, an r-axis, and a t-axis. We're interested, of course, in the r-axis, which has to do with the ventricle. And in this case, the computer agrees that we're at about 120. All right, so we got rate, rhythm, and axis. Okay, for just clarity's sake, I'm going to go ahead and erase all of this, and we're going to start looking at some special circumstances. We have already shown that we've got a sinus tachycardia with a right axis deviation. One of the concerns that we have in this patient who's young, he's 48, is a myocardial infarction, but the other possibility is a pulmonary embolism. If this is a myocardial infarction, we would be concerned in a right-sided ventricular issue because we've got a right ventral branch block pattern. The other thing that we have talked about and we talk about in our course on EKG and also on pulmonary embolism are the certain and specific EKG findings that we see in pulmonary embolism. Now we say specific, but they're actually not specific for so that you could actually make a diagnosis of, and they're not sensitive so that if they're missing, you could rule it out but they are associated with pulmonary embolism and core pulmonale, which is when you have an increase in right ventricular pressure. So what are the things that we see occasionally? Well, the one that is classic, but probably you should not take to the bank, but you should probably know what it is, is called an S1Q3. And then I'm going to write this as an upside down T, and you'll see why here in a second. T3. So this S1Q3 T3 has kind of been classically described in the literature as being associated with right-sided pressures. And we have a similar example to that here in this case, although the Q is not as good as it should be. But let me show you here. The Roman numeral 1 is this one right here. And you can see clearly here that we've got a fairly large S wave in lead 1. And that's what gives us S1. The next one is going to lead 3. Roman numeral three, which is right here. And generally you should see a little bit more of a Q wave than you're seeing here. I'll draw one in so you can see what I'm talking about. So you should see more of a Q wave there. You're not, it's small, but nevertheless, that's what you should see. And then the next big thing that you should see is a upside down or flip T wave in lead Roman numeral three, which you can see very clearly right there. So what we have here is kind of a S1Q3 T3, but something else that is seen in pulmonary embolism that we talk about also in our course is the flipped T wave in the precordial leads. This shows a right ventricular strain pattern. And of course it's showing up in the precordial leads because those are the leads that look best at the right ventricle. And you can see that very clearly here. As it turns out, this patient did have a very large pulmonary embolism and it was picked up pretty quickly here on the EKG. and anticoagulation was begun. The two things about pulmonary embolism, you can sometimes pick it up on EKGs very quickly. You want to make the diagnosis quickly, and you want to think about pulmonary embolism because almost all of the tests that are run and give you a diagnosis of pulmonary embolism are specific for pulmonary embolism. So a CT angiogram is specific for pulmonary embolism. A VQ scan is specific for pulmonary embolism. A D-dimer is something that you order when you're thinking about a pulmonary embolism. The point here is that unless you think about a pulmonary embolism, you will never make the diagnosis of a pulmonary embolism. The other thing I want to make clear here as well is that a methodical prescribed method of going through EKGs will give you things that you might not always see if you just glance at the EKG. So make sure you go through in a systematic way. So the second thing, as I mentioned here, is flipped T waves in the precordial leads. You might also see that, remember, in myocardial infarction, which is in the differential diagnosis. So make sure that you are thinking about these things. And if you want more information on this, head over to medcram.com, where we have a EKG course, which will give you continuing education credits, and also a pulmonary embolism course that goes over the epidemiology, the diagnosis, and the treatments with the new oral anticoagulation medications, and also discussing the antidotes for those medications now. Thank you for joining us.